This afternoon's programme, which marks the 50th anniversary this week of the death of H.G. Wells, is called Minds Growing Out of Ourselves, and it's presented by Peter Kemp. I'm standing in a room on the top floor of what is now the Henry Cole Wing of the Victoria and Albert Museum in South Kensington. The walls are lined with paintings and the entire space is given over to art. In the 1890s, this room was a biology laboratory with an adjoining lecture theatre. It wasn't full of art lovers, it was full of science students. One of those science students, the young H.G. Wells, was to become the most prodigious writer of his age. And it was this room, and what he learned in this room, that he always stressed launched him on his career. He certainly seems by hindsight now to be wizened in some strange way, like a sort of dried prune you discover in an attic. There's no glamour attached to him. And yet, when I was young, it was very glamorous to read Wells. Anybody who presents themselves as total relevance to now risks being completely rejected when now becomes the past and anybody who predicts the future the moment the future has arrived and isn't the same appears to be a bit tinny and a bit thin and what i've discovered on this reading of wells curiously is that he's a much better writer than i thought he was i think what's distinctive about wells is the combination of a number of qualities imagination a kind of scientific accuracy in his use of material and then, a passion for changing the world. There are writers who have the first two, very few have the third. I think that Wells is more than a writer. He's a missionary crusader, something like that. He's a figure of world proportion. Jonathan Miller, A.S. Byatt, and Professor John Carey on H.G. Wells, who died 50 years ago this week. During the later decades of his life, Wells' reputation, once immense, was in decline. After his death, it plummeted. With many of his books now out of print, he's probably most remembered as the originator of science fiction stories from which films bristling with spectacular special effects have spun off. The journalistic spotlight has occasionally flickered over some more controversial aspect of his career, his affair with Rebecca West, his advocacy of eugenics, but his literary accomplishment has attracted less attention. In this program, I want to show why he is a writer of continuing excitement and importance. That the brilliance of Wells' writing is now rather obscured is partly his own fault. When he died, he left behind him a dauntingly uneven mountain of prose, science fiction, social novels, utopias, encyclopedias, short stories, biography and autobiography. Within this bulky literary legacy, though, lies work that sizzles with vitality, poetry, wit and blazing inventiveness in its urgent engagement with mankind's predicaments and prospects. It's an achievement that's all the more remarkable in that it was produced by someone who began life in miserably disadvantaged circumstances. So what transformed Wells into the literary phenomenon and global celebrity he became? The answers are to be found in two very different rooms that in opposing ways acted as crucibles for his genius. One was that South Kensington laboratory where we began. There, in the autumn of 1884, thanks to a scholarship he'd won, Wells first encountered Thomas Huxley, the veteran campaigner for evolutionary theory, who was celebrated as Darwin's bulldog. Here were microscopes, dissections, models, diagrams close to the objects they elucidated, specimens, museums, ready answers to questions, explanations, discussions. Here I was under the shadow of Huxley, the acutest observer, the ablest generalizer, the great teacher, the most lucid and valiant of controversialists. That year I spent in Huxley's class was beyond all question the most educational year of my life. 
What Wells learned from Huxley in that Victorian laboratory with its green shaded gas lamps, anatomical drawings and jars of bleached specimens in preserving fluid shaped his mind and his career, as he himself recalled in a broadcast in October 1935. Before him, among other objects, was a dead rabbit. He took up and stroked the little body as he sketched the cycle of its life. Here was something that had just been living. We were going to see in the laboratory how it was made, how its body worked, how it was related to other and similar forms. We were going to ask ourselves, what was it had held this small furry individual together, made it run, eat and play? What animal? What animated the swarming, eating, burrowing multitudes of its race? That little limp, furry body was the key by which we were to make our way towards the understanding of the whole incessant network of life. It was a world that could seem antiquated, but whose animation also stirred another admirer of Wells' work, Dr. Jonathan Miller. It has an oak panelled South Kensington feeling to it. It's not the crackle enamel and the cathode ray tubes and the machine that goes ping of, of modern science. It's the desk-bound, mahogany-topped science that I remember when I first went into it. In fact, I was drawn into science, in a sense, by the image that Wells and Huxley projected of it, particularly Wells. Very heavily polished teak benches with curved brass taps in these old labs. Now, they simply don't look like that now. I can't reconcile myself, the science that goes on now, with the science which first imprinted me. And that science was undoubtedly the science of H.G. Wells. It was the science of gentlemen, let us imagine, frock-coated figures presenting stories of lost worlds and imaginary voyages. And in a way, you see, the representation of the time machine, of the voyage into time, of the first men on the moon, are merely extensions of the journey of the Beagle and HMS Rattlesnake. But if the science seems out of date, does that leave the novelist A.S. Byatt thinking Wells' work lacks contemporary relevance? Probably now in the 1990s, with this immense upsurge of theoretical interest in the way Darwin changed our minds. We're now going to see Wells's fiction quite differently. I must admit to being very much more interested in it in the 1990s, having read Darwin and having read a lot of modern Darwinian scientists, than I was when I read it as a kind of cranky, slightly theosophical stuff when I was a girl. It seemed sort of very old-fashioned and um, fitting on to Madame Blavatsky and the Golden Dawn, which was, of course, another kind of interest in the mind, and Wells had it. But it feels to me now like a scientific acknowledgement of the fact that Darwin had said we were evolved bodies, and our minds were probably evolved minds within our bodies. The mind that had evolved within H.G. Wells soon channeled its imaginative energies into impressing on other human minds the crucial fact of their biological nature. The fact that we are, as he says in his novel The Sea Lady, matter with minds growing out of ourselves. Huxley, who imparted this idea to Wells, also demonstrated to him how such notions could be spellbindingly conveyed as John Carey, Merton Professor of English Literature at Oxford and editor of the Faber Book of Science, points out. There's a paper where Huxley, a famous paper, where Huxley is lecturing about geology. It's called On a Piece of Chalk. And he talks about the formation of limestone. And he says that certain kinds of limestone are made by the gradual laying down of the skeletons and exoskeletons of tiny, tiny marine creatures, microscopic creatures. And of course that is a way of imprinting on your imagination the idea of geological time. Now I think that Wells learnt from that kind of teaching to spring surprises on the reader which are surprises that bring home 
scientific ideas. At the start of the first men in the moon, when Cavour has uh, invented this substance which is supposed to cut off gravitation. Now that's a completely foolish and unscientific idea. That will be an example of what I would call Wells's imagination or fancy outrunning science. But he thought, just for the sake of imagination, what if you had something that stopped gravitation? And the first time that Cavorite is made, there is an enormous tornado, winds sweep in from all sides, and a large part of the Earth's atmosphere sweeps up into the stratosphere. And, and luckily, the Cavorite goes up too, because Wells said if it had not done so, the world would have lost its atmosphere. He says the atmosphere would have been ripped off the world like the skin off a banana and thrown into outer space. Later, it would have come back, but it would have come back on an asphyxiated world. The skin of the banana image is a bit like, I think, the T.H. Huxley notion of the, these millions and millions of creatures laying down their skeletons and building up a stratum of limestone. It's that very vivid way of making an almost unimaginable scientific idea accessible to the imagination. Extending those vivid teaching methods into fiction Wells started his writing career with a spate of science fiction, The Time Machine, The Island of Dr. Moreau, The Invisible Man, The War of the Worlds, that exhibits with dazzling virtuosity that the human species is just as subject to biological constraints and pressures as any other. scientific truths about our situation that we are a passing species facing eventual extinction on a planet that is also doomed are unrolled with eerie flair in his first work the time machine john durant professor of public understanding this is a period when some scientists are captivated by the idea of a universe running down the notion of entropy, of, uh, of energy becoming unavailable, the heat death of the universe. These are scientific ideas of Wells's early manhood. And if you read the closing chapters of The Time Machine, what do you find? You find a world running down. And the image is that this is all going to end rather badly. <laughs> At last, a steady twilight brooded over the Earth, a twilight only broken now and then when a comet glared across the darkling sky. The band of light that had indicated the sun had long since disappeared, for the sun had ceased to set. It simply rose and fell in the west and grew ever broader and more red. All trace of the moon had vanished. The circling of the stars, growing slower and slower, had given place to creeping points of light. At last, the sun, red and very large, halted motionless upon the horizon, a vast dome glowing with a dull heat and now and then suffering a momentary extinction. At one time, it had for a little while glowed more brilliantly again, but it speedily reverted to its sullen red heat. I perceived by this slowing down of its rising and setting that the work of the tidal drag was done. The earth had come to rest with one face to the sun even as in our own time the moon faces the earth. The desolation of that distant scene, grim testimony to the inexorable workings of the second law of thermodynamics, is something A.S. Byatt also connects with what Wells would have learnt from Charles Lyell's peerings down the long geological perspectives of the past. This is an aesthetic product of the geology of the 19th century. He is the heir of all those people who understood through Lyell's work that the earth was infinitely old and at the same time perceived that it might be f finite in the future, in some unimaginable future. And he gives you aesthetically this wonderful sense of a changed vision of time which you inhabit. What Wells does is 
give you a kind of concrete imagination of living in another kind of place. The sunlight had crept down the cliff. It touched the drifted masses at its base and incontinently came striding with seven-leagued boots towards us. The distant cliff seemed to shift and quiver, and at the touch of the dawn, a reek of grey vapour poured upward from the crater floor, whirls and puffs and drifting wraiths of grey, thicker and broader and denser, until at last the whole westward plain was steaming, like a wet handkerchief held before the fire, and the westward cliffs were no more than a refracted glare beyond. How can I describe the thing I saw? It is so petty a thing to state, and yet it seemed so wonderful, so pregnant with emotion. I have said that amidst the stick-like litter were these rounded bodies, these little oval bodies that might have passed as very small pebbles. And now first one, and then another had stirred, had rolled over and cracked. And down the crack of each of them showed a minute line of yellowish green thrusting outward to meet the hot encouragement of the newly risen sun. For the moment, that was all, and there stirred and burst a third. It is a seed, said Cavour, and then I heard him whisper very softly, Life. The astronauts of the first men in the moon getting their initial wondering glimpse of lunar life. Wells' early science fiction keeps opening up such mind-expanding panoramas of strange worlds in order to jolt his readers into awareness of the conditions governing life in their everyday one. His short stories, a genre at which he particularly excelled, drop characters rather as if they were guinea pigs in a laboratory experiment into fiercely testing milieu, the black depths of the ocean, a jungle patrolled by killer ants, a beach crawling with homicidal octopuses. But for John Carey, one of the most revealing stories harks back to South Kensington. He conveys, for me, the intervention of class into education more poignantly than almost any other writer, even Hardy. There is a wonderful short story called A Slip Under the Microscope, where a very Wellesian young man, who is a cobbler's son, I think, is at college, at Science College, clearly the same one that Wells went to, and there is also a young aristocrat called Wedderburn. And the cobbler's son accidentally, in the course of examination, jogs the slide and is able to identify the specimen and goes and admits to the professor who says that that's the end, he's off the course, and this is just the behavior you'd expect from a cobbler's son. When Wedderburn hears it, the reader realizes that the same happened to him, but he didn't confess. And he, of course, is able to continue with the course. And I think that's the most bitter story and based on experience of what it was like to come from Wells's background at the end of the 19th century and try and penetrate English education. That he came out so unmarked is astonishing, I think. Class was a potent factor in moulding Wells' imagination and the situations and scenarios it envisioned. South Kensington gave him the ideas he spent a creative lifetime working over, but it was his childhood habitat in Bromley, south of London, that was responsible for the intensely individual artistry with which he fictionalised these ideas. Atlas House was a tall, thin building. The street level was a shop which sold china, and behind that was a, a small parlour. But most of Wells's childhood would have been spent down in the basement. Because the house was built on a hill, the basement at the back looked out over the, the yard of the house. But at the front, the only light was got by a subterranean window from which the only view Wells would get was people's boots walking by on the pavement outside. So it was, a, it was quite a dark, cramped existence that he had down there. Simon Finch, Bromley's local studies librarian. Much of Wells' writing is social and political protest against surroundings like that cramped, dark basement in which obsolete ideas festered. The intellectual suffocation he experienced there also hallmarked the time he spent as an increasingly mutinous apprentice in the drapery trade. I was taken up a narrow staircase to the men's dormitory in which were eight or ten beds, 
and four miserable wash hand stands. And I was shown a dismal little sitting room with a ground glass window opening on a blank wall in which the apprentices and assistants might sit of an evening. And then I was conducted downstairs to an underground dining room, lit by naked gas jets and furnished with two long tables covered with American cloth, where the eating was to be done. The jaunty late Victorian and Edwardian social comedies Wells wrote, The Wheels of Chance, Kipps, The History of Mr. Polly, take him back to this fusty environment. In them, the contrast between the smothering monotony of work as a shop assistant and the euphoric sense of escape on rare holidays is as striking as the distinction between the claustrophobia of Bromley and the streaming natural light in which the South Kensington laboratory was bathed. The arrival at the inn was a great affair. No one, they were convinced, would take them for drapers, and there might be a pretty serving girl or a jolly old landlady, or what Parsons called a bit of character drinking in the bar. There would always be weighty inquiries as to what they could have, and it would work out always at cold beef and pickles, or fried hammered eggs, and shandy gaff, two pints of beer, and two bottles of ginger beer foaming in a huge round-bellied jug. The glorious moment of standing lordly in the inn doorway and staring out at the world. The keen smell of the bacon. The trotting of feet bearing the repast. The click and clatter as the tableware is finally arranged. A clean white cloth. Ready, sir, or ready, gentlemen. Better hearing that than forward, Polly. Look sharp. Well's own permanent release from the drudgery of drapery, as distinct from the all-too-transient one Mr. Polly is enjoying there, encouraged him to regard scientific education as something that could save the world, just as it had saved him. His writings, especially his great sardonic panorama of Edwardian society, Tono Bungay, highlight education as something that liberates human potential. John Carey. He feels the tragedy of people who are not educated or badly educated and who could have lived more fulfilled lives had they been educated. That comes up again and again, obviously with Mr. Polly, but again and again with these lowly fictional characters who you can see have aptitude. He thinks of them as little starved minds and he's furious, of course, that money isn't spent educating them, that money is spent on battleships, battle fleet, when it could educate children. So I think that sense of waste is very deeply present and even better, you might say, the determination to right that wrong and so to produce an outline of history. That whole movement into popular education, both in science and in history, seems to me a huge step that again no fiction writer you can name elsewhere in the 20th century ever undertook. So in the educational field too, I think that Wells's thinking was so remedial and so generous. Generosity towards such characters, coupled with indignation at the restrictions of their situation, gives Wells' social fiction a doubleness of mood. This is also perceptible in his science fiction. The time machine, for instance, brings chilling news about the future of the human race and the planet we inhabit. But counterpointing these bleak bulletins is the exhilaration of a narrative that tingles with masterly storytelling, vibrates with haunting visionariness, and hums with the elation of a young writer first realizing his powers. As John Batchelor, professor of English literature at the University of Newcastle makes clear, these forward-looking works have their starting point in existing ideas. They are very well seen and have been well seen by some writers as part of the literary decadence, as works which play with evolution, degeneration, the decay of the species, and also play with possible destructive forces acting upon man in the future. So Wells was using a current pessimism and a sense of apocalypse, which was very much around in the 90s, but he transforms it. However nightmarish his vision of the Martians, there is a huge excitement in the way that he presents these inventions. So we, paradoxically, however dark Wells's view of the future of mankind, his writing about it seems celebratory, and that I very much like. 
in that last scene in the time machine where the time traveler is on a deserted beach or deserted except for himself and killer crabs like dining room tables that try to eat him one detail I remember he, he talks about a white butterfly that goes by screaming and that wonderfully surreal detail of a screaming butterfly, you know, suggesting all kinds of life we know nothing about, is, I think, what transforms an otherwise depressing book into an exciting book, because his imagination is working all the time. John Carey. What makes Wells' work teem with the weird and wonderful are the sometimes nightmarish, sometimes gorgeous forms his imagination gives to his scientific perceptions. As a biologist, for instance, he recognizes that human beings, like other organisms, need to eat and to avoid being eaten. In his fiction, this dispassionate realization mutates vigorously and freakishly. For as someone who, as his autobiography feelingly records, spent a malnourished childhood, Wells was peculiarly fixated on all aspects of ingestion and digestion. Predators prowl his pages in menacing profusion. Grisly munching echoes through his paragraphs. Characters are gobbled by albino humanoids, attacked by peckish bird life, leached on by bloodthirsty orchids. Even when his creations aren't carnivores, he can't resist fitting them out with features that suggest they are. The Martians in the War of the Worlds, who subsist by injecting blood, have no digestive organs, we're told, but Wells still eagerly equips them with mouths that look horribly voracious. For Jonathan Miller, these creatures aren't merely lurid opportunities for the movie industry, they connect with deeper and more troubling matters. I think there was something wonderfully disgusting about those, and I suppose in a sense that he, he was rather brilliant in that he anticipated some of the wilder fantasies of, of Steven Spielberg about the appearance of the, the extraterrestrials, the others. Though he was a great deal less sentimental than Spielberg. It's very interesting to compare the visitors in the Close Encounters with the visitors that arrive in The War of the Worlds. Spielberg wants to make them like charming fetuses, deeply humanoid, textureless, but enchanting and w well wishing. What I think is so interesting about Wells is that he did have a streak of European pessimism and a sense of they would probably be utterly unlike us. I think that this is where Wells is a brilliant writer of scientific fiction, not of science fiction, but of scientific fiction. The image of the of the London at the end of the War of the Worlds and the brilliance of making these creatures arrive in Basingstoke, in commuter land. A big, greyish, rounded bulk, the size perhaps of a bear, was rising slowly and painfully out of the cylinder. As it bulged up and caught the light, it glistened like wet leather. Two large, dark-coloured eyes were regarding me steadfastly. It was rounded and had, one might say, a face. There was a mouth under the eyes, the brim of which quivered and dropped saliva. The body heaved and pulsated convulsively. A lank, tentacular appendage gripped the edge of the cylinder, another swayed in the air. Those who have never seen a living Martian can scarcely imagine the strange horror of their appearance. The peculiar V-shaped mouth with its pointed upper lip, the absence of brow ridges, the absence of a chin beneath the wedge-like lower lip, the incessant quivering of this mouth, the gorgon groups of tentacles, the tumultuous breathing of the lungs in a strange atmosphere, the evident heaviness and painfulness of movement due to the greater gravitational energy of the earth. Above all, the extraordinary intensity of the immense eyes culminated in an effect akin to nausea. Sex is another biological imperative to which Wells applies his distinctive enthusiasms and antipathies. And once again, his imaginative patterns can be traced back to his early years. This time, his repressed adolescence in the Bromley basement with its sparse supply of stimulating reading matter. One important element in that first bout of reading was the bound volumes of Punch, and its rival in those days, Fun. 
The bound periodicals with their political cartoons and their quaint details uh, played a curious part in developing my imaginative framework. And across the political scene also marched tall and lovely feminine figures. Britannia, Erin, Columbia, La France, Bera. Within the narrow bounds of nationalism, the whole of this little planet is not too big for Englishmen. We are a world people, and we belong to the world. World's utopias are designed as ideal life support systems for Homo sapiens, perfect ecologies in which the human race can thrive. They are also, in essentials, the Bromley basement remodelled, hoisted high into the light, made spacious, orderly and purposeful, cleansed of clutter and sexually enlightened. In his fictional works, their establishment is invariably preceded by mass destruction of old world lumber, bonfires, conflagrations, wars, calamities. More worryingly, in some of his early 20th century writings, Wells suggested that utopia must be achieved not merely by the purging of substandard things, but by the purging of substandard people. How does John Batchelor, author of a critical study of Wells, read these pronouncements? In his politics, he is in fact a late Victorian socialist who doesn't move very far beyond that position. So that some of his intellectual positions can take you back to Ruskin, actually. Ruskin always saying, we must completely transform our present society, but also that it needs strong leaders. And I think that's one of the explanations for some of the very ugly bits of a modern utopia, where he appears to be, for example, advocating eugenics. Jonathan Miller feels this sinister thinking needs to be explored in the context of its period. I was rather surprised by hindsight to have seen on my father's desk in his consulting room, and here was my father, the son of a Russian Jewish immigrant who made it himself as a successful psychiatrist, who went to Cambridge in 1908, very much that sort of Huxley and Wellesian world. And he was this Jewish intellectual with the journal of the Eugenic Society on his desk. He was there on his desk even after the war. Now, I was very startled to think that a man who had every reason by virtue of his birth to think that this doctrine and this society really boded ill for him could still, in fact, have the journal on his desk. And I think it's very hard to reconstruct that world between the wars and indeed before the First World War, when eugenics was a respectable idea amongst intellectuals. They surveyed the world of the London poor and thought, along with inheriting ideas of degeneration from French intellectuals in the 1850s, that something had happened to urban man, that there was a genetic sludge being created by modern life, and that it ought to be put right. And it was genuinely philanthropic and benevolent. But of course, as soon as procedures were imagined, they were misanthropic and malevolent. The ethical system which will dominate the world state will be shaped primarily to favor the procreation of what is fine and efficient and beautiful in humanity, and to check the procreation of base and servile types, of fear-driven and cowardly souls. And the method that nature has followed hitherto in the shaping of the world, whereby weakness was prevented from propagating weakness, and cowardice and feebleness were saved from the accomplishment of their desires, the method that has only one alternative, the method that must in some cases still be called in to the help of man, is death. The men of the new republic will hold that the procreation of children who, by the circumstances of their parentage, must be diseased bodily or mentally, is absolutely the most loathsome of all conceivable sins. They will hold, I anticipate, that a certain portion of the population exists only on sufferance, out of pity and patience, and on the understanding that they do not propagate. And I do not foresee any reason to suppose that they will hesitate to kill when that sufferance is abused. John Carey, author of The Intellectuals and the Masses, sees a further vital double-sidedness to Wells in the way his fiction 
overturns the arguments advanced in books like Anticipations. That work is close in time to the fiction called When the Sleeper Waits, where the villain, Ostrog, puts forward proposals very like Anticipations, almost word for word. So, you see the thing from both sides. He'll think about it as, in Anticipations, that proposal is quite, it seems, a hope for mankind, the way of cleansing the world of its failures, and then he shows you how it would affect actual people. He is deeply moved towards the people he condemns in his abstract thinking. His fiction really is, is only successful when it embraces such types. And I think that with Mr. Polly and Kipps, and to an extent with Tono Bungay, a kind of, not sentimentality, because I don't think he is sentimental, but a kind of concessiveness comes into Wells' thinking and feeling, allowing warmth to enter his mind. The saving side of Wells that is full of genial relish for the taking idiosyncrasy of humble characters like Kipps and Mr. Polly has an obvious literary precursor in Dickens. But as A.S. Byatt argues, Wells is even more the artistic heir of 19th century writers whose work quivers with imaginative response to Darwinian science and its insights. I do see him very much as following the two great writers who understood what kind of intellectual shifts were happening in the Victorian times, which is George Eliot and Tennyson. Wells, I think, was more bullish. He felt that we were going to understand more than Tennyson did. But that is because he was much less dependent on the classical tradition and the religious tradition and much less emotionally attached to it. So, in a sense, he took on board what frightened Tennyson and said, this is exciting. We are going to be a new kind of man with this understanding. But he does also have Tennyson's nostalgia for an ordered universe which is lost. If you think of George Eliot in Middlemarch, writing about Dr. Lidgett, whose research is to be to find, as it were, a primitive tissue which mutates through all sorts of things to make up our, our eyes, our brain, our body, and in a sense could be said to prefigure the DNA. It came through Bisha. That is the same kind of mind, George Eliot's, which sees that this kind of thought has changed everything. And um, what Wells did was take up what George Eliot did, which was to show these ideas working both as ideas and in a whole society which they were changing at all levels in different ways. In a sense, In Memoriam is a personal and religious poem about the briefness of human life and the largeness of everything else. And Middlemarch is a dense social web of images about the briefness of human life and the largeness of human aspiration. And Wells wrote about both. But he added something, he added a kind of punchiness, a kind of exhorting people to get on with it and grasp at what was offered, even though in the end they would be defeated because they were finite. Wells carried these Victorian preoccupations, anxieties and anticipations through into the 20th century and unleashed them influentially across it in all directions. His imagination spawned outlandish progeny monsters, mutants, extraterrestrials that have swarmed through our centuries science fiction right up to the ravening dinosaurs in Jurassic Park and the city pulverizing space invaders in Independence Day. At the same time as Huxley's disciple, he stands in direct ancestry to today's distinguished scientific popularizers, Stephen Jay Gould, Stephen Hawking, Richard Dawkins, Steve Jones, and John Durant. There are some ingredients in Wells of the position that we find ourselves in today. For example, he does have this almost celebratory approach, I think, to some of the big ideas of science, that these are of transcendent 
importance. And so I think still do we today. There's a fascination amongst the public, as there was in Wells's day, with some of the big ideas of cosmology and evolution. And also there are some, but just a few ingredients of the questioning of science, which I think has become much more prominent in our day, that, that the moral ambivalence of science, the frailties of scientists, the potential for the, if you like, the abuse of scientific knowledge, the questioning spirit, not around, I think, generally the big ideas of science, but around the practical applications of science. That has become a chorus of questioning in our time. Uh, and I think it's that crescendo of noise about the proper limits of science, about the nuclear question, about the side effects of science and technology, and so on. Those things, I think, distance us in some sense from Wells's day. More and more in keeping with a growing climate of intellectual and imaginative fascination with science, Wells' best fiction still pulses brilliantly and energetically with a combination of scientific integrity and artistic audacity. It's this, John Carey suggests, that gives it its enduring appeal and importance. Clarity and succinctness, I think, are very important to him as an artist as well as a thinker, a scientist. And a kind of ingenuity. If you say, well, who is the finer prose writer? D.H. Lawrence or Virginia Woolf or H.G. Wells? The traditional academic answer is, of course, not Wells. I am not so sure. It seems to me that he is a master of prose, that not only these sudden poetic images, but also the ingenuity of the writing, the mastery of plot, are in a class that is very rare in European writing. Science still says we shan't attain the truth, but if we haven't got a concept of precision, accuracy, intellect, truth, we shan't get anywhere. And I would add, life is actually very boring. And Wells knew all that. He knew that this kind of integrity and this kind of pursuit of accuracy was what was most valuable about human beings, I think. A.S. Byatt. As we now look back at the man who spent so much of his life looking forward, it's increasingly apparent that the body of literature he launched with the time machine is travelling through time remarkably well. And half a century after his death, the issues he so pioneeringly broached, ecology, global pollution, overpopulation, the evils of nationalism, the dramas and dangers of our biological nature, seem ever more burningly alive. Minds Growing Out of Ourselves was presented by Peter Kemp, author of H.G. Wells and the Culminating Ape. The readings from Wells' works were performed by Christopher Scott and Michael Thomas, and the producer was Simon Coates.